There are countless reasons why a game might get overlooked. A great video game can get passed over because of an unfortunate release date, or the unexpected success of another console, or even because critics didn't care for it at the time. Sometimes it's a complete mystery what succeeds and rises to the top of pop culture consciousness. The Sony PlayStation has tons of games that were truly amazing at the time, yet didn't strike gold. Brave Fencer Musashi is such a game. While it isn't a complete unknown, it still isn't common knowledge. While I recall the game as being a solid action RPG and an amazing little gem, I wonder if it plays as solidly as I remember. Find out if this game is an underappreciated classic or something that should be lost to history when the gaming historian and I team up to recomplete Brave Fencer Musashi. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of The Completionist New Game Plus, a show in which I am recompleting the first 120 games from the original Completionist lineup. More information on that in the description down below. So today's New Game Plus is a very special one for several reasons. One being, this is going to be the first episode in which we have a guest here on New Game Plus. Everyone, please welcome Norm, the gaming historian, to the show. Hi there. But one of the cooler things about today's episode is that not only is Norm one of the first guests we've had, but he was not included in the original episode that we shot, uh, mostly because I didn't know Norm at the time. So this is going to be very different for everyone at home. It's going to be a different experience, and I'm really excited because, uh, Norm, I, I'm i excited because I think you're excited, and I think that's crazy. Yeah. Like, no one talks about this game ever. Yeah, this was a game that came out, you know, late 90s where Squaresoft was... Huge because of Final Fantasy VII, it like changed changed everything for the Sony PlayStation, and so people found this game Brave Fence from Musashi on a demo disc, and they're like, "Oh my God, a new game from SquareSoft," and it was a little different than Final Fantasy, but still just a really solid game from SquareSoft. So with that said, guys, buckle up because today we're going to be recompleting Brave Fence from Musashi. Let's do this. <laughs> Ray Fencer Musashi was released by Squaresoft in 1998, but originally began development the year before. It shares a lot of DNA with two other big games that Square was working on around then, one of which became one of the biggest RPGs of all time. Obviously, I'm talking about Saga Frontier. Brave Fencer is seriously the in-between game of Final Fantasy VII and VIII, but the developers at Square made an effort to separate the game from other RPGs. The story was inspired by Japanese historical figures and legends, and the gameplay is original and unique. They were throwing a lot of stuff at the wall to see what would stick, kind of like when I'm trying to decide what to do with the date with my girlfriend. I just kind of cover all my bases to make sure nothing gets left out, including the dogs. She loves those dogs more than me. Norm specifically requested wanting to play this game with me. He super likes this game and just replayed it recently. The first time I played this game for the show, I was really on board with it, and I am psyched to play the game with someone who's just as pumped as I am. And who knows, maybe I can absorb some of his knowledge as he's here with me. Gerard the Historchinist. That came out way worse than I imagined. I'm very sorry for that. When the game was released in North America, it was originally packaged with a demo CD that had demos for many upcoming Squaresoft titles, most notably Final Fantasy VIII. I won't lie, I definitely bought this game because of the included demo. I know I'm not the only one. It's similar to how they sort of slide in Indiana Jones 4 to any collection of the series so that they're able to say it sells well. This is one of those games that slipped by a lot of people when it came out, but one that I absolutely loved. The sweet swords, the rad magical abilities, and the epic yet silly storytelling blend together into a delicious samurai sampler. The first time I played it, it became one of my favorites of the era, a truly underrated classic. I'm hoping that it stays as sharp and surprising as the Ninja stars I keep hidden under my keyboard in case of attacks by the eventual corporate undermining of YouTube. Robots will rise, and when they come, I'll be ready. While the game wasn't a blockbuster hit, it still sold decently and brought the fantasy action RPG back into the mainstream during a time when people thought Square was all about turn-based emo boy epics. A lot of gamers saw this game as a Zelda-like, but it's really more like a souped-up Secret of Mana. Wait, you say Secret of Mana too? 
Everyone says Secret of Mana, but I say Secret of Mana. It's really exciting for me. Square was at the top of their game during development, and this game is a testament to their creativity. It's really interesting going through old reviews on GameSpot and IGN and seeing how reviewers were really fixated on the idea that Brave Fencer Musashi was going to be Square's Zelda killer. In case you haven't been paying attention, Zelda is still very much a thing. But after replaying the game with Norm, I can really see what Square was going for. Even if the destruction of the Zelda franchise was not achieved, Brain Fencer is still a really fun game. Brain Fencer Musashi actually just celebrated its 20 year anniversary of release in Japan. Square Enix released a video commemorating the game, so maybe there's hope for an updated release for modern consoles? The first time I played this game, there was definitely a few sticking points that made it difficult to complete. I remember having a blast with most of the gameplay, but some of the 3D platforming sections were really rough. Some of the collectible stuff was pretty baffling as well, so we'll see if Norm and I can remember how to find all the collectibles in this game. I am really looking forward to having the experience of playing this game with another person, because one is the loneliest number that you'll ever know. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. Completing this game is going to take time, as there are tons of collectibles and upgrades to worry about. And the first thing we will have to do is beat the main campaign. There isn't a hard mode in this game, but I'm pretty sure there's some kind of completion bonus for getting through the game more than once. Brave Fencer Musashi is divided into six chapters, filled with different enemies and challenges to overcome. So we will be adventuring our way through to the end, and most likely reloading our game save post-campaign playthrough to do cleanup work in order to get all the collectibles. Next on the agenda is completely max out Musashi's stats, most notably his health and bincho points. So we'll have to get all that taken care of by reaching level 30 and finding little Minku critters and shaking them down for berries. The catch is, they can only come out at night, so we'll have to look around for their poop. We'll get to that a bit later. Included in this is also leveling up all the swords to their maximum levels. Also, we will be rescuing any trapped characters in the green crystals called Bincho Fields. Yeah, I know it's kind of weird, but how else are we supposed to get stronger, huh? Go to the gym? No way, man. We're gonna become the Swolo Bros. Let's go! Then we will want to collect all of the pieces of legendary armor in this game. It wouldn't be an RPG without a set of armor that grants magical abilities. I'm pretty sure each piece directly affects gameplay to some degree, so we will have to find a few for plot purposes. The rest, though, we might have to go a little out of our way to get Musashi looking styling. Lastly, we will have to gather all of the action figures. Yes, there's an action figure for every character in the game. Basically an in-game model to look at and love. I remember this part was the hardest to fulfill the first time I played this game, mainly because I didn't know what to do to acquire certain statues. I love collecting stuff, but I hope no one opens any of these action figures up. Gotta keep them in mint condition. You know no one can open the boxes because they're digital, right? It's actually impossible. Norm, you of all people should know that everything belongs in a museum. Look, just just because I'm the gaming historian doesn't mean everything. Everything, Norm, everything. Box it all up. Square took several risks making Brave Fencer Musashi, and the result is a game with a very consistent art style, tone, and rock solid gameplay. The first time I played this game, I was shocked by how much I liked it. I remember Brave Fencer taking action RPG tropes and elevating them with a bunch of clever systems, and I was wondering if they still held up. This time around, I was really able to appreciate the humor and tone of this game, as well as the complexity of the world they built. Some of the platforming stuff is way crusty, but overall, I think the game Gameplay is pretty damn solid, like a well-forged samurai sword. Story opens up in the land of All You Can Eat, which is under siege by the Thirst Quencher Empire. In the past, All You Can Eat was defended from another threat, the Wizard of Darkness, by the legendary Brave Fencer Musashi. To counter this new invasion force, All You Can Eat's Princess Filet tries to summon the famous hero. Instead of the hero of old, she winds up with his reincarnation, the wisecracking boy Musashi. Sometimes you've got to roll with what you've got, so Musashi is given the Sword Fusion and asked to recover Lumina, Brave Fencer Musashi's legendary weapon, before the Thirst Quencher Empire finds it to stop the rise of evil in the land once more. 
pretty standard RPG stuff so far. Why is it that empires are always so damn dastardly? And why does this one sound like an evil Mountain Dew commercial? Still, it's a fun premise to get the ball rolling. Musashi must prove himself to his allies and find the power within himself to show that he really is related to greatness. Once you have your two swords, the full structure of the game becomes clear. Musashi must find five elemental scrolls to power up Lumina to its full potential. The scrolls are hidden within dungeons, and the player must slash and fight their way through enemies and bosses to acquire the power they need to save the all-you-can-eat kingdom and stop the Thirst Quencher Empire from drowning everyone in delicious soda. I mean, resurrecting the Wizard of Darkness. Same thing. The game alternates between two dungeon-like areas full of enemies and puzzles, and more of an overworld exploration situation where Musashi interacts with NPCs and takes on quests and so on and so forth. I thought the game's structure was well designed then, and I still think it is now, with no one puzzle or quest totally halting our progress. The chapters are set up in such a way that even if you miss an item or something in a previous chapter, it won't hinder your progress down the line. You'll never feel like you're lagging behind or missing out on things. You know, I appreciate that the tone is set so strongly right away. Yes, it's a heroic epic that spans an entire nation and puts the fate of the world at stake, but also, you're trying to save the all-you-can-eat kingdom, everyone. All. You. Can. Eat. Every character on the good guy side is named after food, and the bad guys are drink puns. I loved puns ten years ago, and for good or bad, I still love them now. The humor is interestingly offbeat. Instead of trying to make a somber tale chronicling the epic tale of legendary Japanese folk hero Miyamoto Musashi, the developers basically drew inspiration from those stories and put a more lighthearted spin on them with a ton of food and drink puns. The high statue characters speak with a lot of fake Shakespeare sounding language, with a lot of duths while also calling Musashi, you little turd, balancing all things. I love the cheesy voice acting then, and I love it even more now. The name's Musashi, you geezer. This game looks a lot like the other PS1 games of the time period, especially other Square products. Being that Final Fantasy VII is one of my favorite games, I noticed that Brave Venture Musashi takes a lot of inspiration from it, not only because of the many mini games, but because everyone has those iconic giant ham hands. Brave Fencer Musashi also draws inspiration from other pop culture moments as well, like a point where you have to Indiana Jones yourself out of the way of a giant rolling statue. There's also that very PS1 thing of putting 2D sprites in a 3D polygonal world, and it's especially evident in places with a lot of trees. I didn't notice it much back then, but I actually find it a little charming now. But the game definitely shows its age with some of the visuals. I suppose we can't all age as gracefully as Gerard and myself. Interestingly, Square chose someone they had never went with to compare and create the score for this game. Tsuyoshi Sakito did an amazing job with the music, with tracks that are distinct, memorable, and just plain rock. The music upholds the Square tradition of their games having great scores. I can only imagine being in that interview. Yeah, our last big game was Final Fantasy VII, so try to create a soundtrack as incredible as that. Yeah, no pressure, new guy. We never had any performance issues whatsoever, and this game definitely pushes the hardware. There are some boss fights that put a ton of stuff on the screen, and there's even scripted voice acting that probably taxed the system. Even when we were battling many dudes at a time, running through a water level overflowing with waterfalls, or keeping track of the dozens of NPCs that keep a daily schedule along with a day-night system, there were never any hitches. Because it's an action RPG, the action part is just as vital as the figuring out what to do next part. The fighting in this game is deep and rewarding, giving a really unseen amount of freedom to players. I loved seeing the magical abilities combined with the sword play the first time around, and I'm pleased to say that this still really holds up very well. The folk hero Musashi is renowned for mastering a two-sword fighting style, and Square did a great job of taking that idea and running with it for this game. The player carries Fusion, which is a katana-like sword great for quick attacks. The Lumina Sword is that huge bastard sword-looking piece, and it's what you'll need for heavier, slower attacks. You always have both swords on you at all times, so it's up to you how you want to develop your fighting style. One of the most original abilities that Musashi has is the Assimilate ability. You can charge up the gauge then just peg a dude with your sword, and if you hit them and spam the absorb button, they will have a special ability you can steal. This opens up a ton of doors for the player, even if I found that at times this ability wasn't really that necessary to get through the main game. Yeah, there are benefits for sleeping in this game. You can plop down right in the middle of the battlefield and take a nap to recharge health and BP. 
It's risky because enemies can still attack you, but doing this can also be a real lifesaver. To me, this is the most unrealistic part of this game. I have never had sleep go interrupted for this long. No way this actually exists. As we went through the game this time around, we were struck by how modern a lot of the RPG stuff is, especially for a game that's two decades old. The in-game clock is awesome. The buildings have hours of operation. Certain characters keep to a schedule, which you have to learn if you want to interact with everyone. It's pretty amazing. One of my favorite elements that I had completely forgotten about from the first time I played this game was that every time you rescue a townsperson from a green bincho field, they're added back into the town's schedule and rotation. So as a player, you're literally restoring life to the town. The music also changes too. Rescuing the musician characters adds those instruments to the soundtrack. It's really genius. Boss fights in this game are epic and awe-inspiring. They're often multi-part with environmental hazards mixed into the fight. I love how they're part puzzle, part screen-filling battle, and I like feeling like a great warrior who also has an enormous brain. But Musashi is somewhat of a jerk, so it kind of balances out right? Tracking down the Minkus isn't difficult. You just look for their poop during the day, and when you come back to that same poopy spot at night, there you'll find it. Always pays to look out for the phantom pooper and bring them to justice. When we started the game, both Norm and I suddenly remembered our least favorite part, the Steam Tower. Platforming is not the game's strongest suit starting out, and getting through the Steam Tower was pretty rough to say the least, especially by the fact that you have to do it two times. Most of the other main campaign wasn't too bad, but this particular area was just as much of a chore this time around. Ultimately, Brave Fencer Musashi holds up extremely well, and I think it's a crime that it's overlooked. I really consider it an underrated classic that everyone should play. The gameplay is fun and interesting, way more than just a hack and slash, and way better paced than a lot of RPGs of the era. It's the perfect blend of action and RPG, meshing as well as Doug Funny and Patty Mayonnaise. As far as completion bonuses go, I'm mixed. Maxing out Musashi's stats is extremely helpful for making battles and boss fights easier, and it comes pretty naturally through battling and finishing side quests. Getting all the legendary armor makes Musashi into even more of a badass, letting him double jump or score critical hits more easily. Finding all the Minkus, the little creatures that give you health upgrade berries, lets you fight the Mother Minku. What was once cute and helpful becomes terrifying. Getting all the action figures is easily the hardest part of the game. You have to purchase them from the toy store in the main town after completing certain tasks, and some of them aren't even available until after you beat the final boss or collect a certain amount of other action figures. We even used the official guide from back in the day in our playthrough, and it was still difficult getting the last few figures. We pretty much had to figure it out ourselves. The internet did not have all the answers. The reward for maxing out Musashi, decking yourself out in legendary armor, and collecting more action figures than Gerard has amiibo is a splash screen that says, perfect. I wish the game gave back a little more than that, but oh well. It's like a metaphor for life. Even if you do all the things, sometimes all your reward is someone giving you a thumbs up and saying, nice job. When we recompleted Brave Fencer Musashi, there were 10 deaths, 6 anime chapters conquered. 5 legendary scrolls collected 35 palace members saved 13 Minku found and 1 cute, fluffy, super scary Mama Minku fought 43 action figures collected, including the 7 special action figures 18 hours of total playtime And one boss fight that was actually an epic dance battle minigame that I totally dominated because I play a ton of DDR and no little kid will ever beat me at DDR, Brian! Playing this game reminded me how much I love it and also showed me another reason for why I love Square when they take risks. It was really fun playing this game with Norm and it helped me get a fresh perspective on what it's like to play a single player game with a friend on your couch. It's also way more fun to riff on a game with someone else who loves as much as you do. Brave Fencer Musashi is a great PS1 game that deserves all the love and should be remembered for more than just including a demo disc in the packaging. Brave Fencer Musashi is one of those games that unfortunately has not received a digital release. Square, I'm begging you, give it to us today because I guarantee you people will love this game. Yeah, it's it's a it's a special game for sure. Um, 
I loved all the little collectibles, like the action figures and the Minkus. Um, I thought the voice acting was stellar, like some of the best on the PlayStation. And uh, the boss battles are really cool. Like you fight some really big enemies and uh, it's just a lot of fun. But speaking about the action figures, if you're a completionist like the way that we did this, it is not a fun time. You will pull yeah. your hair out trying to find those final ones. The last ones are a bit of a pain to get. They'll drive you crazy. But aside from that, this game is a wonderful time to complete. So, with that in mind, guys, we still give this game our completionist rating of Finish It. Finish It. That's all the time we have for today, guys. So please, as always, let us know what you thought about today's episode somewhere on the internet. Please, guys, please, 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 take my word for it. Go check out Norm, the gaming historian, one of the best channels on YouTube. I kid you not. His video on Tetris is mother flipping brilliant. It's an hour long. Go check it out. It's incredible. Norm, and thank you for being here. And you're not just saying that because you're in it. You do, I, a, I, you do have a quote in there. <laughs> I forgot. I do have a. I do have a small cameo in it, but no, it's still an hour of greatness in there. You well, should go you. check it out. Thank you, and thank you for having me on. Absolutely. To uh, recomplete a great underrated title on the PS One. Absolutely, guys. Support Norm. Norm, anything you want to promote before we head out? Yeah. Uh, so I stream on Twitch, twitch.tv slash gaming historian. It's a lot of fun. I play retro games. I play indie retro games. And uh, I have facts going in the chat. Like I have a bot that spams facts about the game I'm playing. So That's awesome. You learn while you watch. Awesome. So guys, with that said, click the bubble that is Norm's face to subscribe. Check out his channel. And hey, if you missed the last two Game Plus, you can click or tap that right here on the screen. We'll see you guys soon for another brand new episode of The Completionist. Bye. Bye.